All right. Matthew 6, 22 and 23. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I'm going to read that again. Matthew 6, 22 and 23. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Very important scripture. In other words, we see through our eye. It lets light into our body. But if something impairs our vision, if something attracts our attention, then our vision goes off of God and instead of the light coming in, we begin to have other motives and then we're drawn into the desires of the flesh and then we start seeing things dimly because of those things in our life. We're just continuing down as we're looking at the Scripture that Jesus was teaching as He was given the Scripture, as He was ministering to the multitude. The lamp of the body is the eye. Yes, it's the gateway to your soul. The things that we see tonight, the things that we hear, the things that enter in through our physical ability to be able to use our senses tonight, the things that come into our life will determine whether we seek after God or whether we seek after the things of the world. Amen? So as we go on down in this just a little bit further, there was a book... It was written by Anton de Saint Exupery, which is an unusual name. In that book, he writes, It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. In other words, to follow God, to want a desire to follow Him, then our eye has to be fixed upon godly things. Amen? Would everybody agree to that? So as he said, it's only with the heart that one can see rightly. So it's deeper than just what you see physically. It's what you see with your heart. Because what we see with our heart affects how we act. It affects how we uh, do our everyday life. Amen? So as we go down just a little bit further, as he made that uh, distinction there, now think of this, and this is from the same the book that he wrote, it's called The Little Prince, in other words, teaching us how to be Christ-like. Today we're posed with the question, see, if for example God would remove four out of five, four out of the five senses and we could only have that last sense which would be sight, what are the things that you would see? Who would you continue to please? What are the things that you would choose to see or what are you blinded to? Amen? So if we are removed of our senses, what are we looking at? What are we seeing with our eyes? What are we focused on? What are we looking for in our daily walk with God? Where are our eyes attent? whenever we're walking through this life. If we look into Matthew 6, 22 and 23, the verse says the eye is the lamp of that body, and if it be then, your eye is healthy, your whole body will be healthy as well. But if your eye would be diseased, your whole body would be full of darkness. If then the light is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? What that means is, once we begin to have our vision blinded, then we start looking at things that we should not be looking at. Amen? Did everybody agree to that? Yes. That's, that's simple math right there. No matter how you look at it. So, it's important for us to keep that relationship with the Lord. It's important for us to walk with Him daily so that the things of God will catch our attention when we're going through our daily walk and the things of the enemy will not hold a candle in our life. Amen. In other words, it won't even draw our attention. 
How many would like to learn how to do that? How many would like to walk with the Lord that where the things of God gets our attention and the things of the enemy we just shun? <laughs> Praise God. That, that's, that's the walk that God has for us. And it all determines is how our walk and our relationship with Him, how we desire. Uh, one thing that we look at, and, and we'll see in just a little bit as we go down, uh, the verse may seem confusing at first, but if you look closely, it shows four different equations. Number one is the eye. It's the lamp of the body. The clear eye states that your whole body is being full of light. In other words, we see everything that God wants us to see. Amen? We see everything that God wants us to see. Number three, the bad eye defines that your whole body is full of darkness or it begins to turn dark. And the fourth is, if light in you is dark, and that describes the great darkness, then we will begin to walk our life in darkness instead of in light. Amen? And Jesus said that we're not the children of darkness, we're the children of light. Amen? Praise God. He's given us the ability that we don't have to walk in that same old, that same old nature of the old, na old man or the old flesh. The things that we have been redeemed from, amen, praise God, we don't have to focus on the things of the enemy. We focus on the things of God and through that, God supplies our needs and meets our needs according to His riches and glory. Amen. Praise God. We're testimonies of this. We are thankful tonight because God still loves us. Let's look at two more verses from the book of Matthew that we looked at a little bit earlier. 6 and 19 through 21 tells us, Do not accumulate for yourself treasures on this earth where moth and rust do to destroy and where thieves break through and steal, but accumulate for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, if you look at this Scripture, it tells us that script, uh, as Christians, we should watch where we place our treasures. What are we teaching our children? What are we putting instilling into uh, the, our grandchildren? People that are coming to church, children that come here that don't have a mother and father that come to church. We are the ones that set an example and set a... Uh, uh, to set a godly example, hopefully, praise God, that whenever they come in, that we set an example of how to worship God. That we set an example of how to live for God and how to walk with Him. Amen? Praise God. If we can't do that, if we can't instill into our children, if we can't instill in those that are up underneath our leadership, if we can't instill in them that God is the most important thing in their life, and if they seek after anything else before they seek after God, then their life will end in ruin. Amen? Amen. Praise God. We got to let our children know this. We got to let our grandchildren know this. We got to let our nieces and our nephews and our neighbors and everybody that we can to let them know that praise God, we're only here for a short time, but Jesus is coming back. And if our life belongs to Him, when He comes back, our children will go. We'll go and we'll be a part of that meeting in the air. We'll be a part of that marriage supper of the Lamb. Praise God that the Word of God has declare to us. Amen. If we have preached to, and this was something that somebody told me a long time ago whenever I first started preaching. They said this. They said, what will it do you if you save everybody in the church and lose your family? And they were right. What would it do if me to take and commit my whole life to trying to live for God and be here for the church and pastor and do the things that God has called me to do. What in my heart could I do to say to people, and I have to be careful, everybody, every, any pastor does, because if you don't, your family will go to the back burner. And everybody else goes to the front burner. And guess whose family hates God? Yep. Amen? 
Praise God. But folks, if we begin to instill back into this world that Jesus is coming soon, and if you are saved, if you have invited Him into our heart, and we belong to the Lord, we're going to hear when He comes back. Amen? We're going to know when it's time to go. But praise God, we need to get as many people saved and as many people serving the Lord as we've ever done before. Amen? Because our time is short. Praise God. You know, the Bible said that whenever, uh, whenever the bridegroom comes, that he, he took and belated his coming. And the church or the virgins, whoever you want to put in there, half had oil, half didn't bring any extra oil. We've been around this earth for a long time now and we've been waiting for the Lord to come back even long years before we were ever born. They were looking for Jesus to come back. As a matter of fact, the disciples says this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel that in the last days God will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. And if they were preaching that day of Pentecost back there was the outpouring of what Joel had prophesied, then folks, we're about to experience something and that is a latter rain and a former rain together to experience an outpouring of God like we've never seen. But I believe God's pulled back that veil in such a way that we haven't been able to sense His presence and we haven't been able to feel His presence. We've had to walk by faith and not by sight. But can I tell you, He's just doing that for just a reason. For us to just get hungry enough to get on our knees and seek His face again. For us to get hungry enough for us to drive ourselves to the altar again and say, God, just one more time pour out Your Spirit upon my family. Just one more time. Because I'm telling you folks, what's coming in this world, what's coming in this world, what's happening around us today, we're going to need God or we won't able, be able to survive. We're going to need the love of Jesus or we're not going to be able to last in this world that we're about to live in. The things that is wanting to be done and the things that are wanting to be implemented in this life and things that we are seeing as a nation where we're seeing ourselves as a nation become not only liberal, but to become as a nation where we will allow anything. Amen? Praise God. We don't stand for anything anymore. Our nation does not stand for morals. They don't stand for righteousness. They don't stand for things at once that we felt like there was at least somebody up there that at least felt some direction towards God. And I think it's so amazing to me that here we can be less or more than 200 years old as a nation and we fell away from God faster than any other nation in the world. In those short span times, others stood for longer than we did. And we were supposed to be built upon the foundation of God's Word. And I tell you, there's still people in this world that love God that have not bowed their knee to bear. And praise God, it's up to us as those prophets are men and women of God to go forth and to proclaim God's Word. And we will see the fulfillment of God's Word being fulfilled. And that is in the last days that He will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh we will see a greater outpouring than has ever been upon this planet. Amen? In the last, in the last days. Well, praise God. We're there. We're there. Let's go on just a little bit further. Alright. Praise God. Matthew 6.24 says this, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or you cannot serve God and money. This verse is telling us to watch over our choices, to be careful. You can't serve God and money. Mammon, what does it mean by that? And everybody always gets this wrong every time you ever hear anybody quote the Scripture. It says, the love of money is the root of all evil. 
Everybody says money is the root of all evil. But the Scripture says the love of it. What the Scripture is trying to determine here is what do you love more? Do you love God or things that you can hold in your hand? It might be money. It might be fame. It might be new wardrobes. It might be a fine vehicle. It might be anything that you can attain in this world. But what are you willing to put before God is what the Scripture is saying. Amen? Amen? Now look, let me get back to the same thought. We're trying to see God through a right vision. We're trying to see God through a clarity of our life that we're looking at the things of God. Now listen, and we'll just use money just for a moment. But if, if we say between God and money, okay, if I look towards God, it doesn't mean money isn't important in my life. It means He'll take care of that side of my life. Amen? I've given that over. What, what that consists of is being a child of God and doing what I'm supposed to do as a child of God. And whenever I do those things, the Lord will be able to minister and to meet my need. But if I start focusing on money, then my focus will be on, well, just making more money. Now, I'm not saying every rich person is bad. But the Bible did say it was hard for a camel to enter into the eye of a needle. It's hard for a rich man to enter into heaven. Amen? Because the riches become your love. But here's what I want to tell you. We're living in a day right now where monetary stuff ain't going to sustain us. We need God. So, therefore, we're going to seek God more than we do the money. But I can tell you this, if you're just after money, if you're just after that, then you will try to figure out a way that you can get more. I'll just tell you this. There was a gentleman that used to go to church with us that was multi-millionaire. And there were some questionable dealings in his background. And do you know that man looked behind his back everywhere he went. He couldn't go anywhere without worrying. And all he worried about was if somebody is going to steal his money. Somebody is going to take my money. And later on, I kind of found out if you get your money by taking somebody else's money, you're going to be worried that somebody's going to take your money. That was his biggest fear in life. Because money had become his God. It could be anything tonight. But if we let anything get in between our relationship and God, then it becomes a darkness in our life, in our vision and we cannot see closely. I'm not going to take much longer, Kristen. <laughs> I see her over there just a square. Line. So listen, who are we going to choose? God or the things of the world? God or the things that we can hold in our hand? We got to choose God because there's nothing else that's going to sustain us in these last days. Okay, let's go on back just for a moment. If we scan this, Matthew 6, 22 again. We will realize that God genuinely wants us to watch what we desire. Now think of that. God is concerned about what we're desiring. He wants us to desire Him. Amen? He's concerned about that. So we realize that God is concerned about what we desire. All of our lives we seek for acceptance. We seek for love. We seek for stability. But for whom are we doing this for? We should always remember to do everything for the glory of God. It may be very difficult to set our priorities straight, but if we seek God, He will deliver and He will provide. Amen? Praise God. And we are testimonies of that tonight. Amen. Matthew 6 and 33 says this, 
It tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. He'll take care of us. Don't worry about it, Wesley. He's going to take care of your family. Don't worry about it. He's got us tonight. Michaela, He knows what you're in need of. Praise God. He knows how to minister into our lives. Even in areas of our lives that we're still struggling in. Amen? Thank God that He is concerned and He loves us today. But let's be careful what we focus on. Let's be careful what we put our time and invest in today. Be careful how we're pursuing after the things of God and seeking after the things of God. If you were to look at the following, what are your objectives for living for God? What are your objectives for living for God? What are our ambitions? What are we focusing on? What are we driving towards? Who are we trying to please? That's a big one right there. Amen. We got to please God no matter what. It doesn't matter who it is. We have to please the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I love the way that God just is strengthening our life in such a way that He wants us to be stretched. Listen, if we all go through life and never ever have to be stretched or never have to have to exercise our faith, then how will we know if our faith is even any good? Because we have to exercise it every day. Every day. Whenever we get up and we've been just kind of re redefining this and reinstilling it in our lives that whenever we get up in the morning putting those things back into order putting God first going into a time of prayer opening up the word of, and reading the word of God whenever we get up in the morning just preparing that day and saying day the, to the Lord Lord this day belongs to you and that if you will pave it for me I'll walk where you want me to go and I'll say what you want me to say and I'll meet who you want me to meet but Lord you must pave my way with your anointing and your presence today and we read the word and we get involved in what we're starting our day out right and I told you as we start our day let's end our day the same way before we go to bed getting out that word of God and reading it and having a time that we pray to God and, and just have that fellowship with him and then we have that opportunity of, of cutting off that light at night and saying Lord as we sleep you said that you're going to watch over us and protect us and can I tell you this he's a good protector Protector tonight. Amen. Amen. Praise God. The things that we're doing, the things of who we are, the things that what He created us to and what He made us to be. Hallelujah. When we fulfill that, He blesses our lives. Amen. When we fulfill His Word. So who are we performing for? Who are we acting in front of? Can we sincerely say that our eyes are clear? Amen. That we're letting the fullness of God in. Hallelujah. So that I can see the next portion of where God's glory begins to glow so I can go towards that. Amen. Praise God. Because I can tell you this, we need those touches from God from time to time. Just as we're walking down our pathway of life. We need God to touch our life.